biology. They, they don't let you study anything more specific than that. It's just biology or not biology. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Um, as Bill mentioned, I'm pleased to have an opportunity to present to you uh, basically this uh, quick sort of summary of some of the data that I've been collecting over the past several years regarding the effects of nitrogen loading and resulting eutrophication on commercially important shellfish. And in particular, for my dissertation work, um, that would be quahogs and soft shell clams, which you probably know most, most of you maybe more from your dinner plate than um, the way I know them. But, uh, and also at the end, I'm going to kind of pull this in together with some other information from other species that we've also looked at in the course of this work. Now, as many of you may already know, uh, here on, in, on Cape Cod in particular, but throughout the world, actually, we've seen an increase in urban development, particularly in coastal estuaries. Uh, and this picture shows Green Pond and Great Pond, which are two uh, estuaries right here in Falmouth. And these white squares that you see sort of running in tracks along the coastal estuary edge are uh, urban development, residential development. And this increase in development on our coastlines and in our watersheds has resulted in an increase of nitrogen inputs to our coastal watersheds and ultimately to our coastal water bodies. Now, to give you some sense of how this actually works, I have created this cartoon with the help of some other folks in my lab, which shows what could be a typical watershed in a Cape Cod water body, where we have a house and we have some impervious area for, say, a driveway or a road. There's a little bit of lawn some gardens, some trees, and then we have a sloping area down to a salt marsh and our coastal estuary with estuarine vegetation. Now there are three basic sources of nitrogen to our coastal waters, and they arrive by different ways. First of all, atmospheric deposition, which is simply the nitrogen in the rainwater, which can land on the watershed or directly on the estuary. And then also um, fertilizer, which is applied to lawns and gardens or golf courses, for example. And then finally, wastewater, which typically in our area comes uh, to the ground through septic systems, leaching through septic systems. Now, the most important thing is that this nitrogen then moves through the soil and through the ground. There's a lot of processes that go on here and transformations, which we don't need to get into today. But the bottom line is that it ultimately ends up in our groundwater and then moves into the estuary itself. Now, in, on, in Cape Cod and in many other areas, we found it as that as these nitrogen loads increase, the source contributing to the nitrogen load that ultimately ends up in our estuary is primary, primarily wastewater. And just to help you visualize this, because I know sometimes it helps to take it out of the abstract to be able to actually see it, and this isn't, isn't something that we typically think about seeing, but this is an infrared, false infrared photograph. It's from Portnoy in 98, and it shows uh, Town Cove in Orleans. And if you look at this photograph, the darker areas are the lighter areas, and the warmer areas are, pardon me, the darker areas are the, light, the cooler areas, and the white areas here are the warmer areas. And this shows, right along here is the boundary of Town Cove. And these sort of streams coming in all around the edge of the cove is actually that fresh water literally seeping into the estuary. And a similar process is going on in all of our local estuaries, delivering nitrogen associated with all the different sources of development in the nearby watershed. Now this increase in nitrogen loading has resulted in eutrophication in many of our estuaries, mostly because nitrogen is the primary limiting nutrient for primary production in coastal estuaries. So what that means is that it limits the growth of all the green stuff. So as you increase your nitrogen load, you actually get an increase in algal production, both in the water column and in the sediment. And this can be in the form of microalgae, like phytoplankton, or also in the form of macroalgae, which you see in the picture here. Now, this increase in algae results in an increased accumulation of organic matter in the estuary, both from the living cells, but also as well as from their detritus as they die. Now, this increase in organic matter also results in a decrease in oxygen content, ultimately, in your near-bottom waters, and can result in the loss of different species that are important commercially. Uh, this has been most best, I guess, recorded in finfish and in crabs. So when I um, started to look at this research and wanted to know what this meant in terms of shellfish, what I found was that there really wasn't a lot of quantitative data out there to help us understand exactly how quantified nitrogen loads result in these type of secondary effects and how those in turn actually affect clams or other types of shellfish and actually link all of that together. Uh, so one of the first things that I did that I thought would be particularly interesting to some of you tonight is that I went back to the literature 
And I said, all right, what can we see in terms of abundance of shellfish or landings of shellfish through time that might tell us a little bit about how um, shellfish abundances have, have been changing as our nitrogen loads have been increasing and we've been seeing an increased accumulation of organic matter and eutrophication in our estuaries. And so what I did was I went back to all of the sources from, for example, the Mass Division of Marine Fisheries and the National Marine Fisheries Service, and I looked at landings or harvests of different shellfish species per permit so I get a sense of the numbers of animals that were actually harvested per unit effort. And I compared the time from as far, about as far back as I could go to get consistent data, which was about 1955, up to 1980. And I took that time period and I compared it to the time period when eutrophication has really been um, increasing in our estuaries and that nitrogen loading has been increasing in our watersheds, which is the time period from about 1980 to present day. And I looked at the difference in shellfish landings. And what I found was here on Cape Cod, we've seen a 40% decline in quahog stocks and a 60% decline in softshell clams. And then when I broadened my search a little bit, I found that in Rhode Island and Maine, we can find a decrease of about 50 and a almost a 70% decline in softshell clams. And then if we look at Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, scallops have decreased by as much as 40%. Now, certainly we can't know that these declines are necessarily related to eutrophication as opposed to something else, but it does raise an interesting question in your mind as to really um, what's going on. And also it raises concern that if eutrophication is affecting habitat for these animals or potentially affecting their food supply, it might at the very least be precipitating these types of declines. So from this, we knew we had a, a real need for data, and we knew that we had a potentially um, interesting question here where there might be some real potential harms that we could uh, identify. So in order to do this, the next thing was to st step back a little bit and look at the information that we had available and try to figure out exactly what might be going on for shellfish based on the information we had so far. And it appeared that as nitrogen loads increase, because you're increasing uh, phytoplankton in the water column, increasing alg algal concentrations, you might actually be increasing food supply for these animals that eat the particles in the water column. So you might actually find an increase in growth. However, as nitrogen loads continue to increase, and you see an increased accumulation of organic matter, and you see those lower uh, oxygen concentrations in near bottom waters, we might actually find a reduction in survival. So this was sort of our initial hypothesis, that we might see this perhaps an increase in growth as nitrogen loads increase, and then a decrease in maybe growth or survival as they increase even further. And so the, the, the take home message, I guess, from what we were starting with was that we figured that eutrophication would probably have conflicting effects on bivalves. And what we wanted to do was establish the net result of this conflicting effect. So to do that, we wanted to ask some very specific questions. And the first question was simply, how does nitrogen loading affect food supply and habitat for these animals so that we would know how to then relate it to the animal itself? So that brings us to our second question then, how did these changes in food supply and habitat affect growth and survival for shellfish? And we also asked a couple of other specific questions that I'm not gonna deal with tonight, but I want you to be thinking about them. And certainly if you have questions about these processes, um, you can ask me about them at the end as well. Um, one area that we were particularly interested in was also, what do clams eat? Because we were interested in, are they specifically eating those particles in the water that are most affected by nutrient enrichment? And also, how do nitrogen loads or how do these specific changes in food supply and habitat actually end up affecting the physiology of the clam? Because that would give us uh, a mechanism, essentially, of how growth and survival may actually be affected by nitrogen loading. So in order to perform this work, we chose a group of estuaries that covered a broad range of nitrogen loads. And these estuaries were located in or near Wakoit Bay off of Nantucket Sound, and also in estuaries off of Buzzards Bay in West Falmouth Harbor and in Wareham. Now, as I mentioned, these estuaries represented a range of nitrogen loads from roughly 16 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year in the lower loaded estuaries. And this is a photograph of an example of one of our lower loaded estuaries. And you can see that the shoreline has very little or no development. It's mostly salt marsh and bordering vegetated wetlands. And then in contrast, our higher loaded estuaries, uh, which went up to as much as over 600 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year delivered to the estuary, uh, were relatively highly developed with marinas and lots of residential development on the shoreline. 
So in order to get a handle on how nitrogen loading and resulting eutrophication might be affecting food supply and habitat for shellfish, we wanted to sample uh, cestin, which is essentially all of the particles that are suspended in the water column, as well as sediment, to get a, an idea of, of uh, how these might contribute to shellfish growth and survival. To assess food supply, we specifically looked at chlorophyll A concentration, which is really a proxy for the concentration of phytoplankton or food supply in the water. We also looked at carbon and nitrogen content to give us a sense of the food quality. As you can imagine, if there's more nitrogen available, it might mean you have essentially more of the building blocks that you need to build protein, to build tissues. And then also we looked at overall the organic versus inorganic composition of the food supply in those, both, both of those sources. And then to assess habitat, we looked at dissolved oxygen concentrations in the near bottom waters. We also looked at EH, which is reduction oxidation potential, which is a measure essentially like a proxy for oxygen availability in the sediments. We also looked at sediment grain size and texture, and then temperature and salinity in the water column. Then to determine how shellfish responded to these changes across estuaries, we looked at, first of all, uh, we transplanted juvenile hatchery reared animals. These are roughly 8 to 12 millimeters in this picture here shows you an example of some of the soft shell clams that we transplanted. We transplanted them into these modified aquaculture cages that are very similar to the cages that are used by professional aquaculturists. They're just much smaller. And we put sediment from the estuary where we were transplanting the animals into the box and then put them in the cages and left them there for several weeks. To get a sense of also, th those were juveniles, we wanted to get a sense of also how adults were growing and also get a sense of what the native animals in those estuaries were doing. So in order to do that, we sampled native animals acro across the widest range of sizes that we could find in the estuary so that we knew that we were getting a good representation of the population of shellfish in each water body. And then we sliced them just down the center. I don't know if you guys can all see this. This is an example of one of the shells that I sliced right down the center. And what we did was we um, looked at the, the rings inside the shell because these animals lay down rings that are not at all unlike the rings on a tree and you can age them very similarly by counting the, diff the rings. So what we did is we used that to determine d relationships between the length of the animal and their age and we plugged that information into a model called the von Bertalanffy model which helps you derive a number that isn't a growth rate but it's a, essentially a proxy for the rate at which those animals approach their maximum size in their population. So for those of you who are familiar with the terminology, it's essentially the rate at which these animals approach their asymptotic growth, where their growth is slowing as they age. So then we applied all of these data to come up with some, something interesting to tell you tonight. Um, this is just an example of some of the data that we collected. This is from the second year of our study, which was 2001. And the first two panels are data from the water column. So this is cestin, which is all the particles filtered from the water column. Now the first panel shows you the chlorophyll A. Now remember, that's a proxy for food supply. The chlorophyll A concentrations. And the second panel is your C to N ratios versus nitrogen load. And what we found was that as nitrogen loads increased, we found a significant increase in chlorophyll A concentration, suggesting there was an increase in food supply for these animals as nitrogen loads increased. Now we also found that there was a significant decrease in the carbon to nitrogen ratios. And if you'll remember, the idea being that the more nitrogen you have, the more potentially the more building blocks you have to make protein. So this suggests you have a higher quality food source at higher nitrogen loads because you have relatively more nitrogen compared to carbon. Um, the bottom panel shows some of the data that we found uh, in our sediment. And this is, uh, again, the reduction oxidation potential, which is a sort of like a proxy for oxygen available in the sediments. And what this suggests is that our oxygen concentrations, or the sediments became more reduced as nitrogen loads went up. Now, although we didn't find a similar relationship between dissolved oxygen concentrations in near bottom waters and nitrogen load, this does suggest that for whatever reason, um, low oxygen concentrations, which may have occurred in the near bottom waters, were better recorded in the sediments than they seem to be in, um, in the near bottom waters. So sort of the take home message from these data are that ni increased nitrogen loads appear to increase the quantity and quality of foods available for shellfish. And they also do appear to alter the habitat 
by causing a, an increase in redu reduced sediments um, and suggesting that there's potentially a reduction in oxygen concentrations in near bottom waters. So in terms of how, that, how the shellfish responded to these changes, I'm going to start with our transplants. So these are the juvenile animals that we planted in those little cages. And we found that when we look at both cohogs in terms of growth in, and soft shell clams and growth in millimeters per week, we found a significant increase in growth as food supply in the water column increased. So that's an increase as the chlorophyll A concentration increased in the water. And that was true in both years of our study across all of the estuaries except two. Uh, and I'm going to hold off here on telling you what happened so that we can look at the um, native animals and see if we found a similar result. And in fact, um, when we looked at growth, and again, keep in mind these are the K values that are the, the va variables that we determined from the von Bertalanthi growth model. So it's not a growth uh, rate, but it's a rate at which these animals are approximating or reaching their maximum growth. We found that they are reaching their maximum growth at a quicker rate as, again, as food supply goes up. And uh, again, since that's related to nitrogen loads, as our nitrogen loads are going up. And again, this happened in, in um, we only did native animals, uh, uh, well, we did native animals in two years, but since it's one pool of animals, it's only for um, one set of data. But it happened in every estuary except for those same two. So this um, told us a couple of interesting things. First of all, that the primary effect of nitrogen loading on shellfish seems to be to increase their rate of growth or the rate at which they reach their maximum size. However, there does seem to be something that affects these animals, at least in two of these estuaries, that's limiting that growth. And the interesting thing about that is it wasn't just something that appeared to occur in one year. For example, if we'd just seen it in our juveniles in the year that we did that study, we could say, well, it's either something that just affects juvenile animals or just affected one year of our study. But instead, we're, we're seeing that it's something that affected these animals in these estuaries throughout their life. So in order to try and decide what those possible factors could be that are potentially affecting growth in those two estuaries, we went back to the literature and we looked at all of the variables that could potentially limit growth, and we looked back at our estuaries to decide where those two things were in common, what was common to our estuaries that might actually be negatively affecting growth. And we came up with two possibilities. The first one is that there's a substantial amount of information in the literature suggesting that high concentrations or excess concentrations of algae can actually limit growth. Or, and it can do that by reducing the rate at which animals feed. So it can actually um, reduce or to some degree even um, to slow or reduce the feeding rates. Uh, the problem that we had was that most of these studies were performed in the laboratory, and most of them looked at phytoplankton carbon concentrations, and that's what this stands for here, phytoplankton carbon concentrations, as opposed to chlorophyll A concentrations. So the first thing that we had to do was to tr take our chlorophyll A data and apply uh, a, co a constant factor to come up with what would be the approximate or estimated phytoplankton, corresponding phytoplankton concentrations. And so what I've plotted here are, in fact, the chlorophyll A concentrations that we measured in each of our studies in each year against the corresponding phytoplankton carbon concentrations. And then I've also put in, in this shaded area, the range in where the laboratory studies suggest that the feeding rates of bivalves are either reduced or, or slowed. And what you can see right away is that for the vast majority of our estuaries in the years of our study, our values appeared above or within this range. Now the interesting thing is that when you go back and you look at our growth rates, you see that the highest growth rates achieved by juvenile transplants occurred well above this range. And in fact, the highest growth rates achieved by the native animals did as well. So what this suggests is that it wasn't an excess of algae or an excess of food supply that was limiting growth in these estuaries. If so, we would have expected their growth to be reduced somewhere down in here. But it also told us something else that's kind of interesting, and that is that it appears that perhaps the combination of foods that these animals receive in the natural environment may somehow allow them to continue to filter just as efficiently um, and not potentially be affected by higher food concentrations, whereas these lab studies really usually looked at monocultures of algae or artificial algal diets. Now the second area that we looked at where there was a potential for limiting this uh, growth enhancement by nutrient enrichment was uh, low salinity. 
And again, there's a substantial amount of information in the literature to su suggest that at certain salinity thresholds, in particular for clams, at about 20 parts per thousand, if animals are exposed to salinity lower than that, their feeding rates are slowed or reduced. So what I did was I went back and I looked at all of our sampling dates and I plotted the frequency of sampling dates for each estuary, and these are in order from lowest nitrogen load to highest nitrogen load. And I looked at the number of sampling days where salinities were greater than 30 parts per thousand, those that fell between 21 and 30 parts per thousand, and then the number of days where salinities fell below this 20 parts per thousand threshold. And in fact, what I found was in two estuaries, and as it turns out, it's Snug Harbor and Weeweantic River, the two estuaries where we found the depressed growth, salinity fell below this 20 parts per thousand threshold most frequently. And in fact, if you assume that the number of sampling days is a proxy for the amount of time that these animals were actually exposed to these lower salinities, then animals in Snug Harbor were exposed to lower, this low salinity threshold about 36% of the time, and those in Weeantic River were exposed most of the time, or more than 70% of the time, to this low salinity. So from that, we concluded that low salinity most likely uh, limited clam growth in those estuaries. But the interesting thing is that even in some of those cases where salinity limited growth, growth still wasn't as low as it was in the lowest loaded estuaries. So um, it's kind of an interesting combination of effects that we're having nutrient enrichment, increasing growth, and then potentially this other unrelated factor uh, potentially limiting that increase. So uh, for those of you who might be more marketing minded or might be more interested in shellfish as a fishery species, you might be thinking, well, okay, um, up to this point you've been talking about growth in terms of shell growth. And what we really want to know is what about soft tissue growth? Because if you're going to take an animal to market, that's the part that's really the most important and the most interesting. And um, so in order to determine whether soft tissue growth increased with shell growth, we plotted the soft tissue dry weight against the length of the animal and for each of the estuaries for both cohogs and soft shell clams and found that in fact soft tissue weight also did increase as length increased. So these animals, when their growth is being stimulated by this increased food supply driven by nutrient enrichment, their soft tissue growth is also being stimulated. Um, another interesting feature that we found is that when we looked at um, the percent nitrogen content in the soft tissue, we found that there was a significant increase in nitrogen content as nitrogen loads went up. Now the reason why this is interesting is because it actually suggests that there's a biochemical change in tissues going on as nitrogen loads increase. So it's actually suggesting that compared to other components in the tissue, say fats or sugars, that animals in higher loaded estuaries have a relatively more proteinaceous soft tissue than animals in lower loaded estuaries. Kind of neat, huh? <laughs> I see somebody going, yeah, that's cool. So we've been talking about growth up to this point and effects on soft tissue, um, but we also did look at survival. And this table just shows you the percent survival of cohogs and soft shell clams for both years of the study uh, for each estuary. And again, these estuaries are listed from the lowest load to the highest load. And if you just run your eyes down the table, you can pretty quickly see that there's no real trend with increasing nitrogen load. There doesn't seem to be a substantial increase or decrease with nitrogen load. But there are some interesting features of this data. Um, first of all, that in 2001, survival was less for, for lower for both species than compared to 2000. And that turned out that it was the year also where primary production or algal production in the water column was much higher. Now there's a substantial amount of information in the literature to suggest that this higher, these years of higher productivity or higher algal production are also associated with lower oxygen concentrations in near bottom waters. So it presents us with, albeit circumstantial, a potential explanation for that lower growth, or pardon me, um, lower survival. Uh, another interesting feature is that in each estuary where survival was less than 50%, and in every, and this is true in every estuary where this is the case, um, those estuaries had lower than four milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen. And what that means, that's a threshold for hypoxia in coastal estuaries. That's a threshold at which most species show some kind of reduced survival or reduced growth in response to low oxygen. So um, 
again, this evidence is somewhat circumstantial, but it does suggest that there may have been some, um, something going on with low oxygen concentrations in some of these estuaries, at least during one of the years uh, in which we were sampling. So in order to pull this all together, um, one thing that we did, um, not only did we look at coags and softshell clams, we also looked at similar growth responses uh, in other projects with oysters, with scallops, and also um, another student before I came into the program had done some work with ribbed mussels, which are a salt marsh species. And um, what I did was put all of this information together so that we could get a sense overall how nitrogen enrichment might be affecting shellfish. And again, this is shell growth in millimeters per week across nitrogen loads. And what we found was that in every case but one, which I'll explain in just a minute, there was an increase in growth with increasing nitrogen loads, and that, that the magnitude of that response seemed to depend on the physiology of the individual species. So for example, oysters are very high capacity filters, high capacity feeders, very efficient feeders, and they always showed the greatest growth response across nitrogen loads. Um, compared to softshell clams and cohogs, which are not quite as efficient and don't feed quite as fast or um, have quite a high feeding capacity. Uh, mussels um, actually are interesting because they do, they are fairly high capacity feeders, but this particular species of mussels lives in the salt marsh, as I mentioned, and so it's exposed to food only when the high tide is actually covering the marsh. When the tide goes out, they have no exposure to food. So um, our thought is that the food, actually exposure to food may have limited the growth response in this particular species. Now the only other species that we studied, which I don't show data for here, are scallops. And this work was done by a woman named Andrea, Sh Andrea Shriver, who uh, got her master's in the program. And what she found was that scallops are such low capacity feeders that even in our lowest nitrogen loaded estuaries, they're essentially maxed out. They're getting as much food as they can possibly process, and so their growth basically stayed flat as nitrogen loads increased. So even though they had more food, they couldn't really do anything with it. It didn't decrease their growth, but it didn't enhance it in any way. And then just to tie this back to what I've been saying throughout the study, is that again, we can relate this increase in growth to the increase in food supply driven by nitrogen loading. So we see growth increasing with each species as chlorophyll A, our proxy for food supply, increases and it keeps the same basic pattern of magnitude of response. So in conclusion, um, basically what we saw was that the primary effect of nitrogen loading on our coastal estuaries in terms of food supply and habitat was to increase our microalgal production, decrease carbon to nitrogen ratios in the water, and cause um, a stimulate reduced sediments or potentially low oxygen, recording low oxygen conditions in near bottom waters. So in terms of shellfish, that equates to an increase in food quantity and quality, but potentially a reduction in habitat quality. We also found that with this overall effect on food supply and habitat, the primary effect on shellfish was the increased shell and soft tissue growth with an increased tissue nitrogen content or potential change in tissue biochemistry. And finally, um, it was interesting to note that other outside factors, potentially not related to nitrogen enrichment, such as salinity, may have limited growth in some of our estuaries. And that low oxygen may have contributed to reduced survival in at least one year of the study. So what does all this mean, and what is the take-home message that I hope you did go away with tonight? Um, first of all, to consider that nitrogen is an important resource in our coastal estuaries. And I think um, in recent years, nitrogen loading, and in particular nutrient enrichment, has become somewhat demonized, and we've started to think of it as a, a pollution. I think it's important, first of all, to realize that nitrogen is a natural part of the system, and it has to be there in the system for things to grow. So initially, it stimulates primary production, which is essentially the growth of all the green stuff, the growth of the algae, that's the food supply for the base of our food webs. And then that stimulation in turn increases secondary production, which is the growth of the shellfish that we observed. So it's, it's good to keep in mind that nitrogen, although in excess we've seen in a lot of cases, it can result in a cascade of problems in our coastal estuaries, there are also some benefits. And it's actually a natural part of the system that has to be there to support it. Now having said that, <laughs> In terms of using this information for management, it's also important to keep in mind that we need to balance those potentially conflicting effects. Um, 
First of all, and it's something that um, I realized Tracy wrote on that little green sheet that she passed out, something I often say is that um, I, I definitely don't want people to think that they should run out and fertilize their estuaries and that, you know, so we can get increased clam, clam growth. Uh, the first thing to keep in mind is that clams don't grow in a vacuum. There's a whole panoply of other species, plants and animals, that are growing in these coastal estuaries, and each one may have different thresholds of response to increased nitrogen loading. For example, we know that eelgrass is lost at nitrogen loads between 70 and 100 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, which is fairly low on the range of loads that I showed you today. And for example, scallops and, say, flounder, as juveniles are very tied to that eelgrass habitat. So if we lose habitat, we're definitely losing species in those cases. So we don't want to run rampant with this information and think, oh, okay, well, let's stop sewering, let's stop remediating any of the nitrogen loading that we've caused to our estuaries, but rather maybe to take this information and figure out how we can best play the cards that we've dealt ourselves. How can we use this information to take advantage of, say, higher loaded estuaries, which might have more food supply for species such as clams or oysters or mussels, but yet stay away from areas where we might actually be tipping that balance and have, say, the reduced oxygen concentrations. Um, and I usually throw out one or two examples of this. Um, suspended aquaculture, I think, is a great example. Um, sometimes I'll refer to it as dock, under dock aquaculture, but it could certainly be done in other ways, where you could have your aquaculture cages suspended up higher in the water column of an, an enriched or potentially considered polluted estuary, where those animals could take advantage of the greater food supply but they're raised up off the bottom where the low oxygen concentrations tend to occur. So ideas like that that we should probably be thinking about would allow us to sort of best meet this balance of resources. In the meantime, while we're trying to figure out how to undo some of the, the problem that we've gotten ourselves into with nutrient enrichment. And finally, I hope that people will ultimately, in some of the ways that I've described, be able to take these data and apply them more broadly to help management, to improve aquaculture, and to basically understand that the, th the things that we affect on our land, you know, you may not think of them as affecting animals in the water or plants in the water, but that those things can have ramifications that can move up through our coastal food webs. So and I just have a number of folks to thank who are involved in this work. First of all, um, everyone from the Boston University Marine Program, in particular Dr. Ivan Valiella, who was my advisor for my dissertation work. Also, um, the Division of Marine Fisheries, the Wakoit Bay Estuarine Research Reserve, and the towns of Falmouth, Mashpee, and Wareham, who were all involved in helping us access sites and providing information. Um, also, our funders, uh, Hui Sea Grant, uh, Palmer McLeod Fellowship Program, and uh, each of the towns, in particular, the Falmouth uh, Shellfish Department. And also, some of the additional work that I showed you at the end was sponsored by the Barnstable, um, Cape Cod's Barnstable uh, County Cooperative Extension. So, thanks. Go for it. Yeah. Is the change in the habitat, does this affect the reproduction of those shellfish? Uh, shell That's a really good question. Um, yeah. A change in habitat in terms, I, I assume you're spe speaking in terms of the low oxygen concentrations? Low oxygen and also the change of the vegetation. The, the, usually the scallops uh, lay the eggs and so forth and so on. Uh, the, I, I can't answer specifically about eelgrass because I haven't been involved in a lot of those studies, but it's my understanding that it, it, at the very least it um, makes the animals that would live there more susceptible to predation. So it reduces survival, if not necessarily reproduction. Um, low oxygen concentrations, however, may in fact actually affect timing of reproduction and spawning. And in fact, algal mats themselves, as you can imagine, if you have a big bed sheet of algae laying on you, if, even if you do spawn, where are your seed going to go? Very often, they don't go very far. They stay right there, and then they are lost through lack of oxygen. So ultimately, it affects uh, recruitment and survival of young that would then potentially be growing up to replace the adults that would be, say, in this case, harvested. So you don't have uh, a replacement of your, your animals lost through harvest. Yes, sir. Uh, 
or is there just less to fish because we've closed a lot of areas? Actually, I looked at that when I was first pulling these data together, and it's been probably three years since I've updated my knowledge on this particular question. But at that time, in fact, a huge area of land had just been opened in the mid to late 80s, so that in fact the net area open for shell fishing had increased. Now, you could get into arguments about, well, was that area actually valuable for shell fishing? Maybe there were other more valuable or more densely populated areas that were closed and these sort of useless areas were open. And I've heard people um, talk about that, but that's a very hard thing to document. And so I, I don't know that we have, that anyone has a, a real good answer to that question. Yeah, Rick. I, <laughs> okay. Well, it, it, it's good to, at the end where you're Well, I'd like very much to do some more work to specifically link eutrophication to low oxygen events to responses in shellfish. The problem that we have in most of these coastal estuaries, and, and since I wasn't, I didn't originally set out to specifically look at low oxygen um, itself, uh, that most of these events are ephemeral and episodic in these well-mixed shallow estuaries that we have around Cape Cod. So it makes it very hard to capture that event. So you don't even know it occurred until you go out and all of a sudden you just see what's called a death assemblage, where there's all these animals in life position, very often still with, with flesh or with the um, periosteum still attached, and they're just all filled with sand. And we can say we know that's what's going on, but until we can actually demonstrate it, it's a really hard sell. Um, but I think that's, that's I, I agree with you. And there is some work, uh, I think I mentioned this year at my defense as well, a woman named Nancy Craig, if you're interested, has described something that I have seen repeatedly in these estuaries with um, a different species of shellfish, where she found that as nitrogen loads increase, you see fewer larger sized animals. And if you think about it, that fits in perfectly with these findings. Because if you have, you're gonna have larger animals if they're growing faster because they, they've got better food and more of it, but you're going to see fewer of them because they're not replacing themselves. They're not reproducing as well. Recruitment's down. And in certain years, maybe you're losing an entire stock of animals if these low oxygen events are sustained long enough. Um, but the problem is, even in her paper, she didn't really have those definitive links. And it's something that's really excuse me, missing from the science. Well, the problem with that is, too, that if you have heavy fishing pressure, you're going to end up with a lower, lower side. Well, and actually your comment about creating bad bottom, that was something that I set out to try to quantify as well. And within the period of time that I had to do that, that's not something that you can quantify. It's something that I think is going on. And I think if you look at our estuaries, not only because of the hydrology of them, but also I think because of this accumulation of organic matter, they tend to be these soupy bowls where you could actually draw rings around the different types of habitat as you move from the shoreline to the center of the estuary. Um, but again, I think that's something you need more time to actually quantify. And we don't have enough data from the past that I had anything to compare my sediment course from that I took during this study to actually quantify that. Just one That's great. Yes, sir. Uh, one of your first slides 
Yes. And where was and, and what was the source of uh, what was the source of the sea? Well, that occurs. That just naturally occurs in all the estuaries. That's how groundwater and saltwater mix. It's always going on. And you had a special way of mapping. There was a false infrared photography, and I didn't do that. It was done by a fellow named John Portnoy, who's now out at the National Seashore. But um, that was in Town Cove in Chatham. I think that's right. Orleans. Thank you, Orleans. Orleans. Orleans, in Orleans. Yes, Jay. That is an excellent question. And there is a woman in our lab who's looking at changes in um, composition of algae in terms of size and also species as nitrogen loads increase. And um, I hope to be able to take my data and compare them to hers once she's done. Um, but I think because of the results that I got, I can kind of answer that, that to some degree it doesn't matter because we saw an increase in growth in both juveniles and the adults. And that would suggest that whatever change is going on, in this case, more seems to be more. They seem to be able to eat it. The other thing um, I had mentioned, one of my questions was, what do they eat? And we did do a number of studies using nitrogen and carbon stable isotopes to trace the foods. And what we found was that the juveniles and the adults appear to be eating the same particles and assimilating the same particles from the water column so that there's no difference in, um, there's not a detectable difference anyway in the method that we use of uh, what, whatever it is that their food, food supply is. Okay, that I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, Scott. That's actually a, a good question. Um, I think something that was particularly interesting in the, the research that was done with scallops that Andrea did, um, what she found, and this was sort of a serendipitous um, finding, but a lot of the scallops became encrusted with um, competitors, essentially, barnacles and slippers and other species. And what she found was that in the higher loaded estuaries, because there was more food, there was no problem with competition. So there was actually some better growth just because they could have essentially more animals packed more densely into a given area, whereas in the lower loaded estuaries, um, that would imply that you could have fewer animals packed into the same area, so that you're, essentially your carrying capacity would be lower in a lower loaded estuary because you'd be more likely to have food that would be limiting and limit your uh, density. Uh, as far as, now what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. Well, oh, stripping. Sure. And that's an excellent question, too. Um, for most of the animals, as you can imagine, um, because of their feeding capacities, for example, scallops, if they're maxing out on their food in low loaded estuaries, they're not really going to have a capacity to f make a dent in the nitrogen load or the, the algal supply in a higher loaded estuary. However, um, the oyster work that I showed you some of the results from, the purpose of that study was expressly to answer this very question. What is the capacity for these animals to sort of remediate nitrogen by doing one of two things, by actually incorporating all of the nitrogen entering into an estuary in a year, that is that total nitrogen load that I referred to, and also assimilating that nitrogen, because really what it's doing, the nitrogen is going into phytoplankton, and then the clams are taking that nitrogen from the phytoplankton into their bodies. Um, and what we found was that um, in estuaries that are more highly loaded, you would really need more than the entire area of the estuary to be covered 
with these animals at densities, the highest densities that you would ever find in aquaculture in order to make a difference. Um, however, in some of the lower loaded estuaries, you actually could um, essentially suck down all of the algae and assimilate all of the nitrogen um, with a high, relatively high, still relatively high densities, but fewer numbers of animals. But the thing to, to keep in mind is, and this is something that um, I did this work actually with Bill, is that um, although scallops, say for example, or oysters, pardon me, for example, may not be able to totally remediate nitrogen enrichment in a given estuary, they could be part of an integrated management plan. So if you're going to sewer and you're going to improve road runoff and you're going to encourage um, aquaculture, they're definitely going to graze down local populations of, of algae. And it will make, obviously, a bigger difference in, a, say, an estuary where nitrogen loads are incipient as opposed to a really highly loaded estuary. Actually, we're talking about two different things. Those masses of algae are actually macroalgae, which are pretty much considered pelagic, even if they're sort of resting right. on the bottom. But there's benthic algae, which maybe is what you're talking about. No, which is I was thinking of the macroalgae. Oh, okay. I was wondering if there's a switch. If there's a point with nitrogen inputs that you switch from it being in the water column to going into macroalgae. Well, there actually is, not exactly in the way that you describe, but there actually is, we see a shift in vegetation types as you increase phytoplankton. Um, actually, what ultimately ends up happening is um, phytoplankton shade out, macroalgae shade out seagrass, phytoplankton shade out macroalgae, and then at some point, phytoplankton shade themselves out. So they actually become self-limiting if, if concentrations get that high, if nutrients and sunlight are both available at that high rate. Um, but um, the question about benthic algae, though, that is something that I considered because potentially some of these animals, in fact, um, in, in fact, it's been suggested with scallops that they can actually clap to resuspend sediments so that they can take in sediment-derived particles. So some part of what we looked at was how much algae from the benthos, as opposed to algae floating around in the water column, are they getting, and can you actually distinguish that? Um, and in fact, you see an increase in benthic, in the algae that's like phytoplankton that grows right along the sediment. Uh, you see an increase in that algal concentration as nitrogen loads go up as well. Yeah, Rick. I don't think we're. Yeah. I don't think we're in danger of, of filtering out all the phytoplankton. Right. I think we're safe. <laughs> but you're right that it is. A, it's definitely a, a, a sort of an ongoing continuum of competition, and you have to consider not only the nutrient inputs but also the effects of grazers as well. And there are wonderful people at our lab who are doing all of those great things. So if you stay tuned and keep track of your talks, you'll probably see them come up too.
Thank you.